What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Billy Collins. Matt D -D 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 Doje. And this is Magician. And the Chuck. Who do we have, big guy? We have Rob -ro 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 Rona. That's his name, Rob Rona. Fans of the show might not recognize that name. Rob's a good buddy of mine. We connected, gotten to know him really well. Why I wanted to bring Rob on the show, and I've kind of been hounding him for a little while. He is an extreme outdoorsman. Set this up. I was talking with Rob. He's like... You know, you ever had those days where you just kind of feel like unmotivated? You're just like, what the hell? I'm just not feeling it. Yeah. I guess Rob was having that day and he's up in Michigan. So what did he do? He went and jumped ass naked into a lake yeah. and walked home, and walked home naked. Nobody saw him. So that explains how far <laughs> That's how, Rob, man, I appreciate you coming on the show, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. Was that a pretty accurate intro? It was perfect. We've talked a lot off camera, homesteading, whatever the heck that is. Yeah. Hunting, fishing, mm -hmm. stuff I should know. Simplicity of life through mm -hmm. hardship, because what you're doing is not the easiest thing in the world. You've gotten away from the TikToks and the Facebooks garbage and just. So what part of Michigan are you from? Grand Rapids, Michigan area, West Michigan, West Central, Lower Peninsula. It's definitely rural. We wanted to have some space, have a little bit of property, you know, we have nine acres, not a ton, but the biggest we had prior to this was just under half an acre lot. We did gardening and I actually started in the suburbs, tapping maple trees, doing some of the things that we could do, just being in a suburban area. We've thought about it forever, just trying to get away from the noise. So we have four kids. And Talk about taking social distancing. Seriously, <laughs> yeah, let's go to an yeah. to nine acres. So we've got a creek. There's some fish in there. And we have a pond. We have uh, the chickens and ducks. I know down here, I I never hunted. I was playing sports. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of it's like, this is what my parents did. I just took the initiative to go out with friends and go hunting. And I've always fished. My dad's a big fisherman. Yeah. I, I guess by nature, you live on a coast. You got to learn how to fish yeah. and, and yeah. tie rigs and stuff. But other than that, no. I mean. Is that something your parents instilled in you? Was that your friend group growing up? My dad was a big fly fisherman. He started doing that because his dad would go on these fishing trips and he was never invited. And he always was like, why can't I go? And it's like something he took upon himself to learn how to fly fish. As long as I can remember, I was on my dad's shoulders going to a trout stream and, you know, wasn't really old enough to fish. I would just sit there and catch crayfish, play on the banks, and give me a little net. And I'd, I'd catch aquatic insects and I've always just had a fascination with the with the outdoors. I and mean, as we were going, doing some of that fishing, I would see deer. I actually took it upon myself to learn how to hunt, in particular bow hunting. Bow hunting is a fairly big thing now, but at the time it really wasn't. And most people didn't take it too seriously. The equipment has come a long ways. It was a pretty big deal to kill a deer with a bow. Not a lot of people were doing it. I wanted to learn. So connected with a few friends who I knew were hunters. I want to say I was 11 or 12. Checked out a bunch of books at the library. Taught myself. Learned from, from mentors. I was fascinated by it. Became basically obsessed with it and it was cool to see both of my brothers now are, are big bow hunters too it's now we still get together every fall and what's the biggest kill that you've had with a bow so n nothing too huge it's an eight point just under about 120 inches which is not really considered a, a huge buck and the inches have to do with the way that the deer's rack is measured right. so they have that's like a massive deer here is that <laughs> eight pointer yeah big rack like that your, your climate's more suitable for a bigger deer than we are we we're in that's a warmer got some humid sweaty deer yeah. you know, overgrown rats but um so talk to us about homesteading what does that mean you see guys making canoes out of logs yeah. and what is homesteading getting back to your roots being more in tune with where food comes from through you know farming through uh, raising animals we're fairly new at this you know we just made the decision in 2020 when kind of the world was blowing up wanting to know that we can find our own food we have well, 20 something egg laying chickens. My wife raised over 130 meat chickens. She sold to, you know, friends and family and that kind of thing. And we have a bunch of them in our freezer. Not something I really wanted to start right away this year when we were <laughs> we were moving in, but my daughter did 4-H this year and raised a, a cow at one of the neighbor's properties. This is yeah. a different world, man. I, I bought a goldfish. I just bought some allergy medicine for my dog. <laughs> like we have our our different strong points. My wife refers to me as a green thumb. I enjoy gardening and I've done that in the past. The animal thing is I would rather go out and kill animals, you know, kill wild animals. And just in the last, oh, the last four or five years here, I've gotten really into foraging for wild mushrooms and wild greens, wood sorrel and nimbit. 
and watercress and um are you still speaking english i don't know i don't know any of these words <laughs> you know like we'll, we'll try to do that every every spring we make a big like salad out of all the fresh greens and we've just kind of learned one thing at a time you know a lot of people are afraid to do that because they hear stories about like oh you don't want to you want to know what you're eating and you want to make sure you're not some poisonous thing which obviously that is true you don't want to be just willy-nilly going around eating anything you see but we call those people pansies rob that's right <laughs> losers <laughs> grab a grab a blade of grass and eat it eat that mushroom growing out of your <laughs> dumpster where that raccoon <laughs> took a dump no that's... but what what i admire about that whole situation is not to say we're gonna ever gonna be in an apocalyptic situation apocalypse. yeah but you have of the best of both worlds i mean you know how to live in you know civilization and you can go off the beaten path and also survive and find a sour weed and eat it and be good you know or honeysuckle whatever what what would your yeah. what would your uh your pitch be because you're not i think sometimes we hear people say you get forage for natural greens and the your media are like these are bleeding heart liberal like <laughs> yeah you know, you're, you're, you, do it, you don't do it because you hate the modern world you do it because you love this world it's not a mm. a revolt or you know, you're not Amish, you know, you sound, sound Amish don't use wireless headphones. I've read that. <laughs> um, but, I did have a big beard for a while. You know, I mentioned to you on the phone, um, you know, my parents, they own, they bought 20 mm. or 30 acres out in the woods, built a cabin called Serenity. Mm -hmm. And it really is like that. This just human call to either the outdoors, the nature, wanting to work with your hands. I mean, now you can click a button. It's not that you don't have to go hunt. You can click a button and the thing that's already hunted will be at your door already yeah. cooked. Yep. What is something you're getting that others just aren't? I mean, I think it's a lot of things. It's a big challenge. There's a lot of reasons not to do something like that or just we are so used to conveniences. It does take an extra effort to hunt for your own food or to raise your own food in recent years here some food sh shortages and some things that we've seen with the supply chain getting disrupted and and people are now all of a sudden you know i talked to a colleague in, a, in another state who's uh, kind of similar here but like uh to go and get a dozen eggs is like eight bucks you know yeah <laughs> i was, I was gonna say what you're growing is is uh the modern version of eight ball cooking because yeah, everybody's yeah, wanting if you can eggs, yeah out, i was trying to figure Crazy, out man. How, how to grow toilet paper back in the day <laughs> that, that, yeah. that tough. oh we got leaves yeah there's that's the other benefit of living in the woods and did i hear you say in the very beginning that you tapped a maple tree to oh man that's you, it i mean yeah didn't you yep. send me some so for the, christmas i did send you some um i don't know if it was christmas time but yeah la last year i sent you a little, I was like little sweet bottle. whiskey shoot yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. next on the list. We we got to do some moonshine or something. But the maple syrup thing, you know, I don't know. That was just something I was in. This is my, this will be my, now my fourth year doing it. Uh, but I started just in our neighborhood. We had, we had one big uh, sugar maple and, and two silver maples. And I had always heard about that. A lot of people said, well, it's not really worth it if you just, you know, have one tree. And I was like, well, I just want to try it. I just want to see if I can do it. And so I, I think I, I used like crock pots and I got a big like uh, cooking tin just put over a fire in my backyard. <laughs> this guy's creating you know, a meth lab. Cinder <laughs> blocks. <laughs> yeah, it was it was cool. It was a fun little experiment, and uh, it turned out and it was some of the best syrup we've ever had. And and I think some of that is just like a psychological thing when you make it yourself. And my goal has been to do a little bit more each year. So the first year I did it, I want to say we got. We ended up getting a, maybe just under two gallons of finished syrup. Then the year after that, did like a little over four gallons. And then last year, this was a last, last year when we first moved into our, our new house in the woods here, did about six gallons. And uh, the more we make, the more, the more we use. We use it in, my wife does like baking and she'll use that as a sweetener. Hey but, kids, I hope um, you like pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> Go brush your teeth. Here's some syrup. I can't explain exactly why I do it. It's certainly not worth it from a cost standpoint. I mean, you could you could just go and buy the the syrup, and it's satisfying to use something that you've created too. Mm -hmm. I love mowing my grass. You know, because you'll hear people say, "Well, how much do you make? Do that by the hour." 
So yeah, if you're right. Your grass right. and it takes you an hour, then you just you just lost however much that is, right? Well, and like you said, you you mow your grass. It also gives you your your time away from everything where you can just put your headphones on and go work. I'm I'm sure Rob, when you're making syrup or fetching eggs or going out in the woods hunting, it's it's your time to kind of regroup, yeah. get the bearings back, you know, and and just get back to basics. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I, I've got some questions, right? You're from Michigan. What is the difference in deer hunting in Michigan or in North Carolina? I guess you wouldn't know. We don't, I don't know shit about deer hunting in North Carolina. I just know that Rob and young jock didn't kill a deer this year. But how come you only shot no deers? Yeah. What the heck? And why is your son upstaging you right now? I just am a terrible deer hunter. I mean, I don't even know why you guys have me on the show. I'm... Have you hunted in the South before? No, I, I've hunted in Ohio. This is for the South, I've been. That's the only other state I've I've hunted deer in. I kind of, from what I've heard, I think you mentioned this earlier, Billy, about the deer being smaller there. I've heard people say that about the the deer, like body size, they're a little bit smaller. I think otherwise, it's a lot more similar than being like in a Western state where there's, you know, also uh, mule deer and and antelope and other things. We have a lot of friends. Uh, I I told you before we came on air. My friend Anthony goes to Alaska for four years, for four months out of the year, and hunts caribou and all that that yeah. fun stuff. And then we also have a friend of ours, uh, Curtis and CJ Strutt. They go to Minnesota and and hunt because the the deer are bigger. That's how I kind of generally know that in a colder climate, it's yeah, yeah. The people love to hunt with money. They're gonna they're leaving. Yeah, they're they're not staying here to get through these winters. I mean, they can they can be started in, uh, I mean, October, <laughs> start snowing and not stop snowing until sometime in April. So we have got like five months out of the year. They got to be pretty hardy deer, just in general. You know, body size. There, there are some big deer, and then especially the you know bucks are bigger than the does. So you get a a big buck, and and uh, especially with bow hunting, it's very common to, you know, even to kind of a sad fact of bow hunting is that you know you shoot them, but you don't always you don't always kill them. It's it's tough to make a really good ethical shot, and you can do everything right, and the deer can you know, jump the, the bow string. It's part of the, it's part of the game. And it, and it, it's, it's one of the most horror. It's just, it sucks when it happens because you just you feel terrible when you injure a deer. My son enjoys bow hunting yeah. over a rifle just because it's, it's yeah. a more of a challenge for him. Mm -hmm. And he also, uh, I mean, my son's, I think probably a serial killer. <laughs> he's real quiet and he doesn't care. He's, He's pissed off that he's, he's like the, the first couple episodes on the Jeffrey Dahmer thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll, see this, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. He's real quiet in the yeah. room. So, but uh, have you hunted anything else? There's a big population of people here that go hunt for for bear as well. Also, duck hunting is and huge. duck hunting. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to get into to duck and, and goose hunting. It's not really. I've done a little bit of small game hunting, and then I've done some predator hunting, coyotes and foxes mainly. I've shot and ate some raccoon before. Um, that's pretty close to bear. <laughs> yeah. Small bear. Not, you make uh... a cool hat. <laughs> this raccoon exactly. tastes like the this raccoon tastes like the dinner I had last night and threw away. <laughs> you don't know what you're eating when you go to a restaurant, but yeah, um, that's, that's very true. Is, hey. So we've heard bow bow hunting is is harder than rifle. Is it explain it to someone that I mean, I get it from a like you gotta do this versus that. That's where the the extent of my knowledge is it a how you have to get a lot closer. You have to be a lot more precise. Yeah. It's impacted more by the wind. I mean, is it just a gun is essentially like a leveled up bow, if you think about it? Yeah, kind of all those things. Um, you have to be a lot closer. Generally speaking, with a bow, you you, you should be about you know, 20, 20 yards from the animal or closer, wow. um, which is not always easy to accomplish. And there's a lot can happen even in, in a 20 yard span. I mean, these arrows are flying 300 feet per second or something like that. So they're, they're going pretty fast with the modern, modern bows. And there's some people who, who use more of a traditional like long bows or, or recurves. I'm not there. I have a lot of respect for those guys, but I, you know, I enjoy, I just enjoy, I think, you know, going back to the, the bow hunting piece versus gun hunting in general. Um, I gun hunt a little bit too, but it's just, it's a different thing. You're wearing an orange, you know, you're required to wear blaze orange and Michigan has like one of the highest populations of deer hunters of any state in the country. We call it the orange army. So you, 
uh, the orange army hits the woods and, and it's like, um, it's like, watch out, you know? <laughs> so I, I just, um, it's a whole different thing versus going dressing in camo and sneaking into a spot, trying to get close to where the deer are bedded and, you know, hiking into some swamp, carrying all your stuff on your back, putting up a tree stand or, you know, climbing stand, something like that. And, and uh, trying to get close enough to that where they're, where you're expecting them to, to travel between bedding and feeding. So you have to understand a little bit more about their their patterns when when the gun hunters are in the woods, at least in Michigan. It's like a it's kind of a free for all. It's like that scene on Caddyshack where they give the caddies like 15 minutes. They can swim in the pool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <It's just all laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. And I guess the difference also in, in bow versus rifle is you can sit in a deer stand with a rifle, have it sighted in, bait, and still shoot, what, 100, 150 yards out. Where with a bow, yeah. you've got to have a steady hand to keep that bow and hit that target perfectly. Yeah. If I if I miss with my gun, I'm not going to be like, shit, I got to go pick up that bullet. Uh-huh. Right? With a bow, yeah. with an arrow, you have a finite number of arrows. You yeah. Know, I don't know why I'm picturing, like, Last of the Mohicans. <laughs> <laughs> that's not wearing moccasins I was just like, or the mongols <laughs> yep like, he's wearing raccoons oh my god he... like matt what is that feather on your head what do you mean <laughs> watch one documentary but um, so it's obviously harder which means there's gonna be less people doing it so it's a little more right. well ar- yeah. arguably it's safer yeah because anyone can pull a trigger the hints why you got to wear that orange life jacket around the middle of the you get the, dick the cheney forest. But is that part yeah. of it too? Is the kind of the being solemn? I mean, is hunting a social sport? Yes and no. I mean, definitely it's bow hunting, especially, is something that um, most most bow hunters, most serious bow hunters are don't don't get along well with other people, with other hunters in the woods. Like you want your space, you want your isolation, you want to be, you know, kind of where the deer are and where the hunters aren't. Uh, the only thing I can relate that to is is because we're both big surfers and stuff. It's like you're out there with a group of people, but when it's time to get away, if you want to be isolated, you know, you're still by yourself. You're out there. Even though you're with a group of people, you want to be at the perfect spot, perfect time, perfect pitch at a wave. So, yeah. and, and I always, my, yeah. my, I, I instantly get rashes on my nipples. I'm not nearly <laughs> as, as big of a, but yeah, I guess, I guess it would be the same way. Like when hurricane swell comes in, the conditions are bigger. It's going to be a thinner lineup. But definitely there's a, you know, going back to your, to your question there, there is a social component for sure. I mean, it's a big deal. So November 15th is the day that gun season opens. So gun hunting, especially is a, is a very much a social thing. And so there's a lot of hunting camps throughout the state yeah. where people will go have an RV or something that's packed with a bunch of people sleeping in there. It's a big deal. They, there's like a lot of schools that are that are closed for the gun opener here. It's very much like a like a holiday. Even though I'm not as big of a gun hunter, I enjoy the the social aspect of that too. Just bow hunting requires a lot more practice. You know, understanding your weapon. There's still some of that with gun hunting too. You want to make sure you can sight in a rifle, but um, or at least shoot it a few times. But you know, someone could give you a gun that's already sighted in. You just go sit in a blind, and <laughs> you don't have to do much on the front end. You know, to really to in theory, yeah, shooting but, deer. So, and I got that from my friend Mikel Buck. He's he's friend of the show, but he's a mm-hmm. big bow person. He I don't even think he does rifle anymore. But, and he said that there's something about actually testing singer, yourself. Right? And just, yeah, 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 yeah. Testing your yeah. skills of using a bow. He's yeah. You know, and Mikel's a very colorful person. He's like any any bitch can go sit in the side of stand and shoot people. <laughs> That's essentially what Rob's saying. With <laughs> yeah. a, very, a lot very, nicer, but we're getting a more vibe, uh, like, PC version. Yeah. yeah, we're getting a vibe of rifle hunters are uh, just bourbon drinking. Yeah, just <laughs> the rifle hunters are are what uh, the worm dunkers are to fly fishermen. You know, they are to to bow hunters what <laughs> the worm dunkers are. The until we're like what the darn bait it? fishermen. Let's transition to to fishing. <laughs> I grew up yeah. on a, I grew up on a creek. The extent of my the last time I went fishing, deep sea fishing, it was for Andrew Mary Joanna. Yeah, yeah. It was like the the event. That was the last time, and I got so astronomically sunburned and chafed. I've never gone fishing again. Where you're in the middle of the ocean with no trees and, and all we and had a was white boat. All we had was beaver. I'm like, guys, I do appreciate this, but I don't want to die. Are we almost done? They're like, bro, we're out here for eight more hours. 
<laughs> and, were you actually fishing or was it the fishing? Yeah. The, no, the it, yeah, I was, dude, I was like burning. You mentioned fly fishing. There's a bunch of different types of fishing. Are there, are there different tribes within fishing too? Like oh, deep sea sure, versus yeah. beach fishing. And it's just yeah. cool how uh, human, we are tribal in nature. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially now with the internet. Now you can, you can join a, facebook group or follow somebody that's all they do is fly fishing so what's the difference between fishing there freshwater versus saltwater the fish are almost completely different kind of interesting being in michigan we're surrounded by the great lakes so we have uh, five different great lakes that are all stocked with uh, salmon and steelhead mostly from the west coast and they're they're saltwater fish that migrate into freshwater to spawn and so we have you know, basically transplants uh, that uh, we've created our own version of of that here in the Great Lakes. So they're they're naturally tro- uh, they're naturally saltwater species, but now they're exclusively uh, like landlocked uh, freshwater variations of the same same species. But uh, aside from that, the only one that I really know of. Most of the, the other fish are are completely different. I've done a little bit of deep sea fishing and. A little bit more of like the backwater fishing in Florida, and and um, I, I think it's a blast. I I enjoy it all. I I'll do any kind of fishing. You know, it's just <laughs> for me, it's um it's all fun. But my the kind of thing I do the most of is trout fishing, trout and steelhead, uh, mm-hmm. which is steelhead is basically a big rainbow trout that that migrates from a, a bigger body of water into the streams to spawn in the spring. Have you ever seen a bear catch a salmon? It's not in Alaska. On the Discovery Channel. That hap- that's, <laughs> that's pretty regular, right? I think it happens in my Alaska? backyard. Wait yeah. a minute, you live on the you beach. Know what I'm talking about where they sit there and the salmon are just like, eat me, eat me. <laughs> and they're jumping I, up and grabbing. <laughs> I, did, I did see a Yeti once. Those things will keep your drink cold forever. But mm. Different Yeti, but. What is a Yeti? Isn't that an abominable snowman? Yes, yeah, snowman, yeah. I was talking about the uh, uh, Bigfoot. Yeah, the Sasquatch. Sasquatch. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Like a Bigfoot in the snow and the Sasquatch. Oh my God. I feel like our channel's taking a new turn. So <laughs> we're going to go on a. You guys, you guys know cams. more about Yetis here. <laughs> we're going to go on and get some helmet so, cams and go find this Yeti. We got to find the Yeti. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it up just a little bit because Matt talked about it before we came back. Of if I'm going blue marlin fishing or if I'm going just flounder gigging or something like that, there's a certain yeah. manliness you feel. From that, yeah. you're, obviously, you're even though you've been doing this uh, homestead for a little over a year, way more manlier than I am. But uh, do you feel like a sense of satisfaction as a man? In the fall, you know, football and hunting, you know, are two of the most manly things a dude can do. And that's actually one of the reasons I stopped playing football was that it, it conflicted with a deer hunting season. And so there's something to too about a, a big game animal like a deer. Um, you know, it's I've not hunted bear. I've not hunted something that could could kill you. Although, you know, a a two hundred pound uh, a white tail buck. Um, I'd be some like, of those things that like if you get close move. enough to them. <laughs> the whole move. <laughs> there have been there have been stories like it's happened before, and people have gotten you know picked up, and a deer will gore them and with their antlers and pick them up, pick up like a two hundred fifty pound dude and carry them you know, hundred yards through the, <laughs> through the woods. I would be the little guy that gets carried on the back of a deer. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have not had quite any, you know, any experiences that extravagant, but, but there is a certain amount of, yeah, it's like a respect that you have. And it's weird. I remember the first, the first uh, deer I, I killed was a nice eight point. And, you know, I was, I was ecstatic. It was just a cool, cool experience, you know, like a life changing thing. And it yeah. made made this obsession you know to kind of took it to a whole new level but it's it, there is something too about that just like bringing it bringing the deer home to your family you know and providing food for your family is is a yeah there's definitely like that masculine piece that i think is um it's a it's a big part of why i do it and i made a big deal like when my son shot his deer this fall we labeled all the meat, you know, because we still have a little little bit of deer from last year, but we labeled it all Shane's deer, you know, so we so we make sure that we 
that we recognize him every time we we eat that for dinner so he knows he's providing food for the, for cool. the family as well that yeah. is so cool that that is so cool to i mean i mean my, some some years might have been tougher to label it but wasn't all of this year's deer labeled his name not yours <laughs> yeah you're, you're, <laughs> yeah <laughs> You got me. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not bitter, honestly. I I have higher standards. You know, I'm I'm going out into like earlier in the year, especially. I could have shot more deer, but I was hunting in spots that were really tough to get back to, and I'd have to either put on waders or take a boat or do you know like you go through. Sometimes you go through hell to get back to these spots, but that's what you're you're going after a different animal. Do you hear that? It's the excuse train. <laughs> Shane didn't worry yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, he he shot his deer. I yeah. was uh, I was talking to Chris about that, and it's like you have a set amount of time you can kill him, and it's like at first, yeah. a set number you're allowed to kill. So at first you pass over a bunch of the smaller ones, and at the end you're like, if it moves, I'm shooting it. Like those little it doesn't deer, matter how those big little it is. deers at the end of the hunting season. Those are like the hot chicks that have to leave the bar before last call. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of marines and, and angry guys that are like i need something now yeah, yeah. that's yeah because i mean when you kill a deer you got to go pick that thing up it doesn't just magically show back you know you got to drag it out you got your deer stand. yeah so it doesn't always so, die right where you shot it you gotta like <laughs> you know what i mean right you gotta track that yeah you Usually you do. Yeah. And that's like kind of, you guys asked us earlier, I didn't really get a chance to, to, to answer this, but like when you, when you shoot a deer with a, with a, you know, you, with a bow and arrow and you, you go and you, you go find your arrow. It's the first thing you do to see, sometimes it's hard to tell because it happens so fast and it's like, you know, matter of seconds and deer will come in and it's like your heart's pounding and you just all of a sudden you fire off an arrow and you're like, I think I hit it well, but I don't really know. And and it's just like a big adrenaline rush and then you go down and you check your arrow and you want to look you want to look at the you know what the blood looks like on the arrow and you know there's different to make a good ethical hit you want to hit double lungs or you know get the vital the you know heart, heart liver yeah. lungs is the is the you know the big area but they can you know make a bad shot hit them in the guts or you hit uh hit low you may get brisket and they may have some fat and hit, like white hair so there's all these little, little intricacies of, you know, what to look for. And the, like the tracking of a deer is a whole nother thing. Like I've got a buddy who does, a, um, he, he has a dog that he, he's got like a, a dog. He went to Nebraska to, to pick up this um, as a puppy and trained it to, to blood trail deer. And now he's going out and he's got like a little side business where he's, he's, he's like, man, I'm tired, deer. I'm tired of looking for this damn deer. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. It's a, it's a big deal. I mean, it happens a lot in bow hunting where somebody will shoot a deer and they, they track it, track it, and runs out of blood. And then, you know, a lot of times you can't see the, the tracks of the deer if they're walking in, you know, higher ground. And so you're just kind of, at that point, you're lost. But, you know, a lot of times like a bloodhound and, um, you know, there's different different animal, different dogs that, that are, you know, bred to, to track these things. Now, they're, now they have, um, like, you know, like everything technology is is involved and you get these like drones that do thermal tracking so they'll they'll from overhead they'll go and track these these deer and guys have these businesses and that's kind of a cool thing too but um but yeah that's what i mean like there's there's all these different pieces of it that you know a person can specialize in and it and you kind of have to know a little bit of of all of that stuff to be to be successful and um like like my son's deer this year he actually, he shot, he, he hit it, made kind of like a higher hit and it happened fast. And he ended up hitting it in the spine, which is like, which is kind of tough for a lot of, especially for a young hunter, because what happens is it paralyzes them. Not to get too gory here, but they, it drops them, but it typically doesn't kill them right away. So you oh, have to yeah. get another, another arrow or, or, you know, go and slit its throat or something like that. Um, fortunately, he was able to get a couple more two more arrows in it and he finished it off <laughs> it wasn't a um super yeah, smooth Lord, kill. <laughs> and, um, you, Dad. No, and i actually remember I you was, took my uh, xbox <laughs> i was kind enough to to gut it for him too just because it's 
when he when he got shit one of the, his arrows went right through the you know kind of the paunch of the, of the deer and it was a, it was pretty gross one of the arrows hit you know it was like a gut shot and um so that when you when you gut the deer it's like everything is just kind of opened up in there and it smells it's pretty tough like gutting your first deer is an experience i had to just learn kind of by doing it and now as time has gone on i get, you know gotten faster and faster I cut it open and rip the guts out basically is the <laughs> but it's you know for a 11 year old kid you know that would be a pretty intimidating thing just to, in general to do that and then to have to, to have to have the smell of a gut shot deer on top of that i just said I always told them for your first year, you're going to have to gut it yourself. But I was like, I'll, I'll spare you this one and you can gut the next one. After all this lifestyle change and getting away from it, what's the most, what's the one appreciative thing that you can get from the whole situation? I'm very grateful <laughs> just to, it gives me a whole new uh, appreciation for life in general. So, I mean, just a, a gratitude, if you will, for where, where food comes from. It is hard for me to sum up, but I, I definitely have always felt, you know, somehow connected to being outdoors. It's more natural for me to be to be out there doing my thing, hunting and fishing, than it is to be, you know, stuck in some building. You know, rain or shine, there's there's always something that's happening outside and it's like a whole it's like a whole nother world. Um so it's it's more than just like an a an escapism type of a thing. For me it's like you said earlier, I can kinda mm-hmm. unplug a little bit. And, mm-hmm. and get into the zone and and a lot of times you just you see things that to me it's fascinating and i'll see you know i was driving down i was actually just talking to you matt when we were on the phone the other day and and uh there's two bucks fighting on the side of the road like right in the middle of the city <laughs> near a busy expressway and, and i was and, like and, hey man right i gotta out. go and he's like i gotta go yeah, I was, <laughs> i'm like was it, are you good he's like I think there's there's two deer. They're fighting right now. I gotta check those out. <laughs> I gotta go get my ballpoint pen and kill this thing. That's right. It's a big deal. It's a big deal <laughs> to see stuff like that. Um, but I mean, I'll get fascinated by, you know, the, those little things. I I see my um I see my cat, you know, kill a, a chipmunk or something like that. I'm like, man, I, I appreciate that. As like they are skilled hunters, and they killed a, a rabbit once too, and feasted on that. <laughs> um. Like, it's just cool to see that kind of thing. And, and it's not just about the, you know, killing the animal. It's like, there's a whole, there's a whole world of, of different things. You know, for me, you know, I start like actually probably in a few weeks here, I'll be boiling maple syrup and, you know, cutting the, cutting the wood, boiling down the, the sap to make syrup. And then after that, doing some steelhead fishing. And then I shift over to more trout fishing and then get into the summertime more uh lake fishing to bass and bluegill and that kind of thing and then do you know hunting in the fall so it's it's really a year-round thing where you can there's always something to do and and you know my kids enjoy this too my wife and kids will you know like it's just a good excuse to get outside and and um like there it, so I'm. I know I'm. I'm. I'm not really answering your question directly. You no, you're actually you are. This is exactly what what I was, you know, going for. And this is this is something that um, I actually I pulled this book out. This is um, called Last Child in the Woods: The uh, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. This was like a um, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. Uh, this book was written and. And uh, it's a really cool, like they share a lot of stats as to why it's so important, so helpful for kids to get outside to, to have these experiences. 100%. And, mm-hmm. and you know, it's, it's a bit of a lost art and, and you can see why. It's, it's, it's tough for parents, especially <laughs> with the, the demands of, you know, making it, getting an income and, you know, supporting your family. And it's like you have limited time to go out and do these things, right? So um but i've just i've always enjoyed it me the the that's part of the you know the challenge of uh finding a way to to fit it in it's not always been easy but you know like i i couldn't stop doing this stuff even if i if i if i wanted to you know like <laughs> i've had to there's been times where i've thought man this be it's gonna be so busy this fall and like like this past fall my son was playing foot his first year playing football i was coaching him and we had constantly stuff going on on the weekends and like you know is it really worth it to to go deer hunting and i didn't hunt a ton but 
you know, still fit it in because it's just like, you know, the leaves start changing colors, start falling, and it's like I got to be in the woods. Like it's just okay. something inside of me just uh, pulls me into the like it's like a magnet, and I'm like, man, I got to get out there and do my thing, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, same thing in the spring with with fishing, you know. It's like the you it just it's it's a weird thing to explain, and but it's always been a part of like there's a lot of there's a it's a big pastime you know type of thing so you have all these like uh uh what's the word i'm looking for like a uh, um nostalgia type of a mm -hmm. you know, like all the the sights sounds and smells of the whether it's the spring or the fall and um i just love being outside and maybe well, it's I'm... all just a big excuse to <laughs> to do something that i i enjoy but well, and on top of that, you're you're building like uh, those memories with your with your family as well. That now, yeah. now your kids are going to move on and and do the same thing and create memories for them. So I feel like I've hijacked this whole conversation. No, 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 this, I don't even. And, and we're com we're coming close to the end of the of uh, this this uh, part. But I do want to ask. You said your wife and your kids are with you on this situation. I'm sure your wife, you both came up with the idea to do it. But do you see your wife in a different? different way like a more of a, a respectful way um, or is it just different than before i mean she of course she's had four kids and I'll, I'll piggyback on that too we were talking earlier this shows the importance of picking a spouse because your first date with her was pretty indicative but like it wouldn't work out with rob if it was like he's not gonna marry a city girl that's like Ew, outside you know yeah. what i mean like you're asking for conflict but yeah that's a great question that's a little side story by itself we were set up on a blind fishing date that's how my wife and i met in college we were we were set up to go <laughs> this is uncle si reincarnated dude. <laughs> yeah. oh man yeah it's like it's like full-blown duck dynasty around here and uh my wife was she was not a huge you know outdoors person but she did grow up like her dad and her brother were were deer hunters uh so she was around it and she had a you know she didn't you know despise it or anything like that i don't think she would go out and do it on her own you know if it, if it wasn't for me but um you know the draw for me i had never met her before but it, it i they they said uh or never seen her i didn't know who she was but she apparently knew who i was you know through this uh or this uh christian group we were involved with and um she <laughs> Yeah, like I was like, yeah, sweet, I'll go fishing, you know. I, and I didn't really know at first that I was being set up on a blind date. I was just asked a uh, friend, Jeff, just asked me, "Hey, you want to go fishing?" And I was like, "Sure, what's the catch?" You know. And um, the catch woman. is your wife. But, it's your wife. The, the rest was history. Yeah. So we we've done a lot of, um, I mean, just a ton of experiences together as a family. And when I think back to a lot of like those you know it's kind of like transformational moments and um yeah like she's been a part of that being outside there's something too just really cool about being able to do that together as a family and to have a have a spouse that you know that supports you in that and and, and it, it's not always been easy like there's times there's times where i want to get away and and i i don't want to be <laughs> fishing or hunting with with anybody else i just want to go out there and, and you know, yeah. be alone and earlier in our marriage especially that was tough when we had you know just two kids at the time and she'd just be stuck sitting there she's like well, you know what on my chopped liver here you know i'm just stuck with the kids and i'm out fishing and she's like well i don't get to do that i don't get a break you know with um and but it's it's different you know it's a it's a different thing and you know we've had to work through through some of that but the you know, it is really cool just having having something that we can do together. At least, you know, we have a common purpose in being able to like homestead to to gain to be to at least know how to get our own food, uh, to have to understand, you know, like natural food sources are it's kind of a hot commodity right now. We we're talking about the chicken eggs and, and um the wild venison, wild forage, morale mushrooms, like it's a big deal. Those things will <laughs> um they're hard to find you know it's like a seasonal seasonal thing and you can only get them for a limited time so um yeah it's like my wife i'm just fortunate that she happens to be all about that and i think half, a lot of it is you know 
just because I've always been so passionate about it. And if I wasn't passionate, I don't know that she necessarily would be, but I, I don't know how much of a choice she has <laughs> in the matter, I guess. Um, because I, like I said, it's kind of a non-negotiable for me. I'm, yeah. um, I'm going to yeah. do these things because it's just me. Like and that is about it. That's a man speaking right that's there. Right, man. Nah, Get but... your ass in the kitchen, woman. <laughs> but no. uh, I think that's a great. I think that's a great place to wrap this up, man. Yeah, and I, oh, by the way, I've never been fly fishing, so I think uh, the magician and the jock may have to take a road trip. Oh my god! Yeah, I'm inviting myself. You don't have to answer yes or no. I'm dumber, just coming. Dumber. And I was like, is it a social <laughs> sport? And I'm like, I've taken a, you know, just over the years, a number of people um, fishing, more so fishing than hunting. But there's something about like a you know a, a steelhead in a stream like an eight to ten pound fish. I don't care who you are. You could grow up in the middle of the city. You could have no experience of ever having picked up picked up a, a fly rod or a spinning rod before. And there's just something about the feeling of having uh, you know this giant fish on the end of your line jumping and you know doing these acrobatic uh, <laughs> trying to get away from you and like where. Everybody I've ever taken fishing and experienced who's experienced that has a big grin on their face while they're doing it. And it's just like, I don't care who you are. It's fun. Like it's, it's, a, you don't have to have a, you know, a, a huge, like, uh, you know, appreciation or background where it's like a big pastime, like it is for me. Um, like it, it's fun for anybody to experience. So I would, I would say that I'll throw that out there as a challenge to someone who's never experienced this stuff before. You know, if you if you want to do it, I mean, look at a, a local guide or something. I'm sure there's a bunch of those, you know, all all around, depending on what you want to go after. But, you know, go fishing, go, you know, do a hunt, you know, with your family, take your take your kid out, get outside and, you know, just try this stuff. Don't don't uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of excuses we can make, a lot of reasons why it's easier to not do the, these things but you got to start somewhere and you got to experience these things so uh yeah i welcome that chance to take somebody who's never experienced it before or is just interested in learning about it and uh to me that's one of the one of the things i've really come to to gain a whole new appreciation for is you know kind of passing it on to the next generation just passing it on to other people who are interested in learning so that's that's a big part of kind of why i'm I'm so interested in it and, and finding purpose and, you know, continuing to do these things. Yeah, that is awesome. And, and vice versa, you can come down here, our budget for the show, we could put you and your family into a motel eight. <laughs> yeah, you know, we the, have the Caribbean Caribbean. We'll teach you the it manly sport awesome. of cross stitching, by the way, we can do that. You know, if you'd like that. So. I think, I think that's a great, way to wrap this up man yeah i, I do too i, I don't know it's about perfect you. I, ending. I see you doing big things in this space whatever that means um Jeez. and you've been you've been so dedicated and passionate about it by yourself you, you know i mean there's something you would do for free because that's you're paying to do it now so i can really see this um possibly manifesting into something you know, whatever that is, you're you're a well of knowledge with this. So, man, we have really, really right, yeah. It's it great meeting show. you too, you. by the way. This is, yeah, likewise. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Like, like I said, we, we're now almost an hour and twenty minutes in, and <laughs> I and appreciate. It it. Yeah, I feel like I'm just getting started now, and could keep talking about this stuff forever. Oh, we'll we'll have you back on for sure yeah, if you man. want to come back on. We we'd love to have you. So, but with love that you. being said, guys, do us a big favor. Subscribe to the channel. Smash the like button. And we'll see you on the next video. Yeah.